the museum that you remember. It's still a home to Lunenburg County's heritage and to Bridgewater's story, but now it's so much more. A hub of art and culture. A home to events and celebrations, to the things that we hold dear and that make us special. To experiences that are universal. And now, we need you. The Bridgewater Museum Commission is looking for new members. For just a few hours of your time each month, you can help the museum grow. Help shape programming to welcome new residents and to make them feel at home. Help to tell stories that need to be heard. And help Des Brise Museum thrive as a center for heritage, art, and culture in our community. For more info or to apply, visit bridgewater.ca slash serve. I'm Amanda Fancy. I'm the dealer owner of Gals Home Hardware and Furniture. We've been at this location for about a year. We started in 1848, uh, way back when. Um, this is our fifth location, so um, you know we've we've never uh, have left the town limits. So when we're looking to build this location. You know we had lots of opportunity to potentially look at home, you know, outside of the town limits. Um, but it was really key for us to be um, and continue to be um, a growing business in Bridgewater. Bridgewater, Nova Scotia is unique. We have a beautiful countryside. Our, our town is 7,500 people, but then, you know, our customer reach is about 45,000. So, you know, we're talking about lots of small communities, um, you know, hidden treasures. There's huge opportunity here, and I think that it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to make the visit, uh, make the call, do some inquiring, because it certainly is uh, somewhere where I think there would be some uh, you know, strong investment opportunities for sure. from Quebec, Montreal. Um, I've studied opera at the Montreal Conservatory of Music, so this is where I've learned about Italian, the language, and the food. And my passion just became bigger and bigger for food. I've been cooking for 20 years, almost. I opened a family business, but the only thing I forgot is that my, my family is still in Montreal, so I'm like, you know, I'm trying, I make new friends, I, I, I'm building this thing, but it is a family business here. My chef is like my brother, his wife is like my sister, so I mean, I, I recreated a family uh, environment. We do the real recipes starting from the real ingredients. And for Italian food, what the secret is, few ingredients and very fresh. So each recipe would be like three, four ingredients maximum. But I mean, it's just the best ingredients and makes it so delicious. If you think that it's impossible to have your own business, I'm the living proof that it is possible. People want us to thrive. We work together. So it, everybody helps each other. If you want to be part of a community, it is the community to be part of.
My name is Joel Holland. I'm the owner and operator of Mamatu Athletics. I found the opportunity, started this gym in my parents' garage, and now we are currently in an 8,600 square foot facility. A lot of people come here because of the community. The, the things that we offer here are different than a normal gym. It's an open atmosphere where you come in, the music's played over the live speakers, not in your ears. You don't put earbuds in and uh, just walk around from one machine to the other. You, uh, you focus on yourself, but at the same time you get to meet new people. We have three floors, uh, which we do CrossFit, uh, boot camps, athletic training, and personal training. We have so many other businesses that are growing our economy and, um, and feeding into it becoming more populated. A place where people actually stay as opposed to leave. We're growing, we're getting bigger, and um, a lot of people are on the same push to become uh, a, a better Bridgewater. I love this place, it's my home, um, and there is no other place that I want, would want my business to be. This isn't the museum that you remember. It's still a home to Lunenburg County's heritage and to Bridgewater's story, but now it's so much more. A hub of art and culture. A home to events and celebrations, to the things that we hold dear and that make us special. To experiences that are universal. And now, we need you. The Bridgewater Museum Commission is looking for new members. For just a few hours of your time each month, you can help the museum grow. Help shape programming to welcome new residents and to make them feel at home. Help to tell stories that need to be heard. And help Des Brisset Museum thrive as a center for heritage, art, and culture in our community. For more info or to apply, visit bridgewater.ca slash serve. I'm Amanda Fancy. I'm the dealer owner of Gals Home Hardware and Furniture. We've been at this location for about a year. We started in 1848, uh, way back when, 
Um, this is our fifth location, so um, you know we've we've never uh, have left the town limits. So when we're looking to build this location. You know we had lots of opportunity to potentially look at um, you know outside of the town limits, um, but it was really key for us to be um, and continue to be um, a growing business in Bridgewater. Bridgewater, Nova Scotia is unique. We have a beautiful countryside. Our, our town is 7,500 people, but then, you know, our customer reach is about 45,000. So, you know, we're talking about lots of small communities, um, you know, hidden treasures. There's huge opportunity here, and I think that it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to make the visit, uh, make the call, do some inquiring, because it certainly is uh, somewhere where I think there would be some uh, you know, strong investment opportunities for sure. My name is Joey Richard. I come from Quebec, Montreal. Um, I've studied opera at the Montreal Conservatory of Music, so this is where I've learned about Italian, the language, and the food. And my passion just became bigger and bigger for food. I've been cooking for 20 years, almost. I opened a family business, but the only thing I forgot is that my family is still in Montreal, so I'm like, you know, I'm trying, I make new friends, I, I, I'm i building this thing, but it is a family business here. My chef is like my brother, his wife is like my sister, so I mean, I, I recreated a family uh, environment. We do the real recipes starting from the real ingredients, and for Italian food, what the secret is, few ingredients and very fresh so each recipe would be like three four ingredients maximum but i mean it's just the best ingredients and makes it so delicious if you think that it's impossible to have your own business i'm the living proof that it is possible people want us to thrive we work together so it, everybody helps each other if you want to be part of a community it is the community to be part of My name is Joe Holland. I'm the owner and operator of Manitou Athletics. I found the opportunity, started this gym in my parents' garage, and now we are currently in an 8,600 square foot facility. A lot of people come here because of the community. The, the things that we offer here are different than a normal gym. It's an open atmosphere where you come in, the music's played over the loudspeakers, not in your ears. You don't put earbuds in and uh, just walk around from one machine to the other. You, uh, you focus on yourself, but at the same time you get to meet new people. We have three floors, uh, which we do CrossFit, uh, boot camps, athletic training, and personal training. We have so many other businesses that are growing our economy and, uh, and feeding into it becoming more populated. A place where people actually stay as opposed to leave. growing. We're getting bigger and um, a lot of people are on the same push to become uh, a, a better Bridgewater. I love this place. It's my home um, and there is no other place that I want would want my business to be.
All right, good evening, everyone. I will call this regular scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to order. And as always, I remind everyone that the town of Bridgewater is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And it is a, indeed a privilege to be here. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion to uh, approve the agenda as circulated? Moved. Deputy Mayor Tanner, seconded by Councilor Brugier. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. And we'll go down to announcements. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know it's a big week in the town, so let's talk about Canada Day. Councilor Caldwell. Uh, yes, I'm pleased to announce there are uh, Canada Day festivities uh, planned for this year. Um, there's a laundry list of events. I, I can't list everything, but I will uh, note a few. Um, there is a breakfast at the Legion uh, in the morning, along with a uh, yard sale at the Curling Club. There's a multicultural festival beginning at 10 a.m., runs most of the day until uh, 4. That's at the museum. Uh, there, uh, Bridgewater Transit is free all day. Uh, there is a free swim at the outdoor pool from noon to 3. There is a circus at the LCLC. There's uh, all kinds of activities on King Street from 4 to 11, um, including food trucks, lots of entertainment. And there's a, f a fresh air film at 9, followed by the fireworks at uh, 10.30. Excellent. And so far, the weather's looking pretty good. So Looks like a great day. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Other announcements? I would like to, on behalf of the entire town, congratulate all our 2022 grads. It's grad week, and uh, last night was prom night, and it was great to see everyone dressed up, especially after a couple of years of uh, uncertainty and, and um, you know, a lot of hard work from parents and staff and volunteers to put together some kind of event those two years, but uh, I'm sure the kids and the parents were uh, happy and relieved that there was a return to normal for for um, prom and of course Parkview graduation ceremony is tomorrow evening um, at the LCLC and so again congratulations to all the, the grads and the parents of the grads I know we have a couple here um, so it's very exciting anything else all right, hearing none, we'll move on uh, to the minutes. We have the minutes of June 13th, 2022, regular council meeting. Any errors or omissions there? Hearing none, motion to approve the minutes as circulated. Councilor mm -hmm. Thorburn, mm -hmm. seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Oh, yeah, I skipped over. I moved. <laughs> I'm going so fast, I skipped right over our delegation. So, <laughs> in my defense, went seven minutes early. <laughs> Um, but our delegation is here, so we'll, uh, we'll ask uh, James Dickens to come down and speak to us about Seahawks Minor Football Club request for permission to install a field lighting system. So the podium is yours and you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, appreciate uh, the council taking time to let me come and speak about this. Um, so our request is pretty simple. Um, we are looking for permission to install six telephone poles and the associated wiring and lights on Kidsman Field um, on the football field side. Uh, these lights belong to the Seahawks, a similar way the lights belong to the Baseball Association and in that and the tennis courts. And in that, we would be responsible for install maintenance and the electricity costs of said lighting. Um, the lights we are currently receiving our uh, sodium metal highlight style, but our intention is to replace them with a, an LED style light bulb um, to eliminate some of the actual electricity cost and the uh, the need for a very large ballast system that has to be installed with it. For a few people that aren't familiar with us, um, we are in year 11 Seahawks. Um, we actually have 110 plus kids registered this season. It is the largest number. We average around 80. Um, we, we, and it took less than two weeks to fill our registration, which normally takes us till August. Um, just about 50% of the kids are Bridgewater Town kids. Um, and 90% of the kids registered will f are from schools that will feed PVEC. Currently, there are no field lights on any soccer style, football style field in the entire South Shore. And due to our season timing, without lights, we're required to go to places that 
um, that will let us on their baseball fields if they have lighting um, to, to finish the season. It's about halfway through the season where it starts to get very dark very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, the HB Studios uh, Soccer Center is not the greatest option for us historically. Uh, they have an indoor soccer league that runs four to five times a week. Um, usually it's Tuesday through Friday, directly in the middle of when our practices <laughs> normally run in the evening. Um, and as you all know as parents, trying to get the mites, grade ones, the twos and threes on a field at nine o'clock at night is just not a doable doable thing. So our plan is to remove the light poles from the current location as soon as permission is gained. Part of that is the reason I'm here tonight to make sure that we have your guys' permission to put them in so Michelin can sign off the other side. Um, locate and plan the install of poles based on the town engineer's requirements to um, avoid the field drainage. Sorry, I left out the word drainage there. Uh, we're going. Our goal is to install and wire at least one set of the lights, so three poles, um, to get this season started to allow practices uh, on the right-hand side of the field looking in from uh, Maple Street, uh, so along where the, uh, the long jump pits are and the bleachers. Uh, our goal is to install in-ground wiring to alleviate some of the requirements for the extra guy wires that hold the poles up. Um, with any luck, they'll go in fairly snug and we won't need the extra guy wiring, but we do have a gentleman that puts them in for a living that's willing to put them in. Um, so he will be better versed on what's required when we get to that stage of the install. Once the first side is side's installed, um, we're looking at connection to the second side probably in the spring of the following season. Um, just to minimize the impact on the field during usage, um, we're going to try to work around like the soccer program that runs there in the summer uh, and try to get it done before a lot of things open up. Pole location plan is roughly this. Um, based on what I can find and talking to some people that have lights on their fields, this is about the location. Um, it's to be just outside the track edge. Uh, and. Uh, on the 15 and on the center 55 and the other 15. And of course, this will be based on talking with the town engineer about how the drainage is laid in the field. These lights will be, well for us it's huge, but it's a multiple stakeholder kind of addition to the field. Um, rugby is excited about us putting these in. Soccer is excited about putting us putting this in. And so is the park fee program. And they also become available for the town to use for events that can't be done on the field because there's no lighting. You know, you guys know what it's like trying to get six sets of portable lighting in away from the highway system as a rental unit to try to get anything done. These would be, that makes these available for that kind of work. Um, we plan on handling all the, 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 the usage requests of the lights so there'd be no extra load on the town. Um, nobody would have to schedule anything, it would all come through us. Um, and it allow us to better use the field. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so days where normally there's no break on the field from us when we start in August, it's five days a week. Um, this would allow us to go to a three day program because we'd be able to stack the teams on the same day, giving the field full 24 to 36 to 48 hour rest between each usage. Um, and it all and it allow us to set it up so there's not as much um, back to back pressure with Park Fuse program um, because of the way they have it set up. We have to limit versus what they can do so we can get on the field, and it, it gives us a little more leeway in that in that respect. Uh, the light pollution issue. Um, it's due to the style of lighting, the light pollution around the field is actually incredibly minimal. Um, if anybody has ever been to a field that's been lit, when you step off behind the bleachers, it gets dark in a hurry. Uh, we, all, we currently run portable lighting on the field, which at the level, at the height it's at, because it's only 12 feet tall, um, there is considerable light pollution into the houses around. Installing this system would eliminate 99% of that. 
and we also propose that we with, with town we set a limit on how long they can run like you know we don't we understand that we don't want the lights on until midnight there are people that live there um, if we set a like and that was just an example of like a 1030 time a turn off time that at 1030 at night doesn't matter it's off you know it it's 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 something I'd, I'd like to be able to talk to you guys about if we get to that point and just as an example I threw in a couple fields that are extremely well lit and you can see how quickly the light pollution drains at the side of the field so in conclusion without the lights um, and with the loss of lights at Michelin our program will be severely impaired due to the only field that had lights will be gone um, our current lighting system is not enough to run practices for more than one team on the field we run currently four programs and we're adding a all girls high school varsity program this year so it's going to be up to five and it very quickly becomes a non-manageable thing for us we just cannot get enough lighting and the option becomes then is we install more portable lighting which then becomes generators and then the noise level increases drastically at the field and we're trying to avoid that as much as possible That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Questions from Council. Council Thorburn. I got a couple. Uh, I guess the first one is the uh, property owners around the field been engaged? Have you been talked to? Do you know what's happening? We haven't had the opportunity um, to engage them about this particular item. When we first got the um, original uh, portable lighting, yes. um, we spoke to a few of the houses that were directly in the treeless areas around the field up, uh, including um, at the time was Mrs. Gow's house which is okay. the directly the one that was the biggest issue um, because our lights pointed directly at her um, and I spoke with her son about it since then um, they both at the time indicated that there was no issue with it they were just happy to see the kids on the field um, she, but she's a huge she was a huge supporter of our program she sadly missed as it is yes she is very well missed in any way uh, is there some grants that you guys can act to uh, get some help financially some there is um, luckily we've been very blessed with um, some people that are willing to step up and do some of the work for free for us um, it's just coming down to getting the permission to get this going so they can start planning on how the poles come out how the poles go back in the ground um, one of our players um, parent is willing to do the pole work um, with a boom truck um, one of our uh, players family is willing to put the poles in the ground for us uh, so it's with any luck the cost will should be fairly minimal um, our biggest issue is whether the wire comes out of the ground at Michelin oh yes because if without the wire if it's if it's not in a conduit system of some kind then it's going to the wire is very expensive and through the exchange of light bulbs from the, the metal halide to the LED uh, the LED light bulbs um, I've got a price range anywhere from 150 to about 250 dollars per bulb, and it's 40 bulbs. Um, but we're hoping through Efficiency Nova Scotia, they will assist us in the transition from metal halide to LED, and we're uh, we're trying to recover as much of the wire as we can from the Michelin side to cut down what we actually need to put put up, and. The, the removal of the ballast should help a lot with that um, if we go to LED uh, or when we go to LED it should it should cut that requirement for for some of the cost down quite a bit in in just the electricity cost alone yeah, great project. so really the, the request from the town is is permission to do it and then a, some staff time just to make sure that where the poles go works with in terms of drainage and, and things like that so it's you're not you're not asking for a financial anything financial from the town other than a little bit of staff engineering time to make sure things are going in the place that correct that. okay no I just want I just wanted to yeah. <laughs> make sure <laughs> it's kind of an unusual well <laughs> <and> <laughs> it's, it's the it's the drainage issue more at the field yep. than anything we just want to make sure that we don't damage the drainage that was put into the field yep um, and because if we ask for, we're asking for the wire to be underground 
Um, it, uh, it saves extra poles going in the ground wire to the other side of the field. And, uh, and we don't want to make sure that we don't cut into that, that, that chunk of, of uh, weeping tile or, or drainage pipe that goes across there. So this, this not only will facilitate evening practices, but now gives you the option for evening games. With correct? the second set of poles in full, um, the field will be lit at the quality of any field in the city. Um, the, the lighting is approximately uh, 6,000 watts per pole. Um, in LED numbers, it's actually like 1,500. Um, and, uh, and the lumens output is, is equivalent to a 1,000 watt metal halide bulb per, per fixture. Um, we should actually be lit very, very clear. Um, you'll be able to do anything there at night with both sides on. Like nighttime sports is a big draw to the community. Anyway, this is this is great. So normally, are there any more questions from Council? <laughs> I'll go with Wayne has hand up first, then Councilor Cole. Yeah, it, it seems to me it would make sense when you're putting the poles and you put all six poles in. That's the intention, yes. time when you hit the crews there. Yes, that's the intention. So there's less, there's less machinery on the field at the time. Um, yeah. I, I should be able to get the poles in pretty much in a day. Yeah, no, no. I just wanted to make sure you're putting them all in now when you're using them. Yeah, that, that, that's the plan is to only engage the gentleman that's volunteered to do the polls for us yeah. once. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Councilor Carl? Um, I would like to commend the group on um, our proposal that would benefit a lot of kids and also be no cost to the taxpayer. My only uh, reservation is I'd feel a lot better if the uh, nearby residents, if we had some consultation with them, just to know that, uh, have some feedback from them or at least the group notified them. Certainly to explain the I liked the the photo of the light, how the light stops, because probably residents might think it's going to spill over. Is that kind of what you're yeah. just letting them know that what it's going to look like would be probably good, yeah. Um, so normally uh, how this works when we receive a delegation, um, we don't make a decision the day we receive it because we need a little bit of time to digest it, ask some questions. So it'll be on, we'll be on the next. We can put it on the next. We'll put it on the next council agenda for um, council to make a decision on permission and going forward. All right. Um, how would you like us to address the, the the people in the area to 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 receive that feedback for you guys? So I I, I don't know if you had anything specific, Councilor Call. I guess for me, I would just like to know that you've spoken to the residents that would be to, who can directly see the field. I guess so that would be impacted by the lights. Is that perhaps? I don't. I guess I'll address this to Tammy. Like, could staff? approach the residents yeah, there and I ask for feet or give them an opportunity for feedback or I I'm suspect not sure. that staff would have to kind of uh, do a, a review of the request to determine you know can 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 poles be installed the drainage piece all that and then kind of the long-term piece of it um, ultimately is they proposing to take them out every year or they're permanently put oh no it's permanent install. yeah so then kind of the ownership piece and all of that so uh, we at that time could probably come to council with a, a uh, suggestion on how the, the residents could be consulted to determine whether or not there's any concerns because ultimately it's the town's field, right? And if there's any concerns, they're going to probably gonna come, to, come, us, come, come to us. Okay. Um, and you're looking at this for next year, not this season. No, it would ha we're, we're, our goal is for this season. Oh, this season. We're, we're, we're behind the eight ball on it a little bit because Michelin drug its feet so badly. Um, on the decision of when they were going to actually take the field out. They were, they were under the impression that they might have the opportunity to run the field again this year, and that's not going to happen. So are the lights out? They're not yet. Okay. Um, we're, like I said, Michelin parent company is waiting on the results of this. Right. Oh, okay. okay. I, so I had talked to someone yesterday at Michelin okay. who thought they were going to run the field lights this year up there. So I guess... Yeah, so the, from what I've been told by the board at the, at the uh, social, club? social club is it's, it's a done deal. They're coming out this year. Okay. So we'll have to like, have that discussion with engineering and park staff to determine how, how easily this could be accommodated this season. And, um, and then we'll bring that report back to council. And maybe then you can make your kind of decision about, about this. Yeah, this so can yeah. it be on the July 11th um, council meeting? I don't know because that means it's right? due like next week, right? So it might end up 
being the first discussion session in August or the council meeting in August? So where they're, they're not asking us to do any of the, other than just making sure that the locations for the poles don't impact the infrastructure that's there for the drainage, because they're doing the install, they're doing all the. We have to, we have to formalize an agreement on that for insurance and all that stuff, right? Because it's on our property. So we need some time to, to look at that and see how we can put that in place. Um, because our insurer will have, whether it's a waiver or whatever it is, so that our volunteers can come on our property and do work. Because if they get injured, they'll look to our insurance to, for that. So we have to just make sure we're covered and, and do that, that piece of it. Um, if we can make the 11th, we will. It's just I would hate to make a promise and not be able to deliver on that. I don't know what engineering is going to say about the whole track and if there's any issues with it. Okay. So it'll be on the agenda as soon as we can get it yeah. on the agenda. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. I, like, I know it's a, it's a steep ask for this season, um, but without the lights, we're really going to run into an issue if, if Michelin is set on pulling them this year. If you, um, if you don't mind, just maybe con reconfirming with them. Like mm -hmm. I said, I, I spoke to someone, I happened to run into someone yesterday at, at the prom who, who noted that they had planned on using the lights and they weren't going to come out to the end of this baseball season, whereas what he said. So just, just making sure who's right, who's, okay. <laughs> who's wrong. I, I will get a hold of, uh, of Don over there again, and, uh, and we'll confirm what we can. Okay, perfect. And then we'll um, we'll circle back when we know when it's going to be on the agenda, and um, then we'll go from there. All right. Um, and I'll send the information as soon as I get my hands on it from Don to Sandra again, so she can get it to you guys. That's acceptable. Mm -hmm. That's who I have for a contact. Yep. So. Yep. That's that's perfect. All right. Great. Hey, any more questions from Council Deputy Mayor Janet? Uh, not necessarily. To you, sorry. Uh, it's more to CIO. Do we have any uh, policy in place that currently restricts at what time? An event like that might need to be uh, turned down, turn, turned turned down. off. Um, in our parks bylaw, do we have out? We have hours of operation. We do, but it, yeah. it would be different because the parks close at dusk, right? But mm -hmm. baseball plays past dusk, so I would think our field usage is different. Yeah. Is it stipulated in the that? bylaw? Yeah, it's stipulated. So we we'd have to have to look and see what what the hour is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks for that. Exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to have a chance to speak with you guys. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We are down to reports and recommendations. We have tender 22. No, I'm skipping ahead again. There we go. Planning items 6.1 <laughs> discharge and development agreement for 814 King Street. <laughs> I knew Mr. Brown was here. He wasn't here for buying pickup trucks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so staff are recommending that uh, council discharge the development agreement at 814 King Street. Um, subject site is directly across from Fancy Pants Cafe. Um, some may know it as the uh, old car wash site. It was in 2013 that council approved the development agreement. Uh, with the then landowner permitting a uh, 4,400 square foot single story office and or retail development. Uh, the development agreement was necessitated by the LaHave River Development Agreement area, which is still applicable today. Since that development agreement was executed in September 2013, there's been no related development activity on the site. In accordance with the development agreement and specifically the termination clauses, council may discharge or terminate the development agreement if development hasn't commenced within 12 months of, of the signing of the agreement. <coughs> Additionally, the new property owner has requested that council consider this, this discharge. So uh, as such, it is recommended that Council pass a motion directing staff to complete the discharge agreement and terminate this development agreement. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? No? Pretty straightforward. Prepared. Yes, Councilor yeah. Sorber? Yeah, but uh, one little question. Is there going to be a new development agreement with the new owner once this one is done away with, do you know? Um, 
It would be required that a development agreement be negotiated and executed for development to occur on the property because of its location within the Lahave River Development Agreement area. Okay. Beyond that, I'm not really at liberty no, to say. No, no, no. I just just want some clarification. Anyway, I would so move that Council of the Town of Bridgewater approve the discharge of the 2013 development agreement on 814 King Street, PID 6002-2407 in accordance with Section 229, Subsection 2 of the Municipal Government Act and the Discharge Agreement as presented in Appendix C of Document 13-097C. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fajir. <laughs> Further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Down to reports and recommendations. We have Tender 22-05E, three new various size trucks. Um, is going to walk us through those. Good evening. Um, here to give you an overview of the report to council. Uh, tender 2205E was issued for three various size trucks. Uh, council approved this capital project in the 2223 operating and capital budget. The vehicles due for replacement are as follows. The 2009 Kia Rio replaced with 4x4 half ton for the engineering. 2010 Ford F-150 to be replaced with 4x4 half ton for the Parks Department. And a 2012 GMC Sierra to be replaced with a 4x4 three quarter ton for the Public Works Department. Uh, vehicles to be replaced have either already been sold as surplus or will be this fiscal year. Finance Department issued five tender packages and received two tender submissions on the closing on 26th of May. Tender documents include the request for alternative fuel source vehicles, hybrid or electric. However, no submissions included those options. Tenders were evaluated on five general criteria, including pricing and technical. Um, the engineering, the average score is for the various vehicles are so the engineering vehicles were 94 out of 100 for Saunders Motors and 74.6 for Mosier Motors. Parks, Saunders Motors gave two options, two different size engines, so it was 93.8 and 76 and Mosier Motors was 59. Public Works Department, uh, Saunders Motors came in at 74.7 and Mosier's came in at 92.6. Uh, after evaluating the tenders using the above criteria, it was determined that two of the three vehicles, Engineering and Parks, tender submissions with the highest overall average scores belong to Saunders Motors, and the third, the Public Works, which was slightly over budget, belonged to GW Mosier Motors Limited. The approved budgets for the three trucks combined is $177,000 net HST, which is $59,000 each. The engineering truck came in at <coughs> under budget at $56,217.49 net HST. <coughs> The Parks Department came in at under budget at $50,034.37 net HST. And the Public Works three quarter ton came in <laughs> slightly over budget at $64,786.63 net HST. The approved budget of $59,000 for each truck is appropriate for a half ton truck. However, the budget allocation for the three quarter ton was done in error and not corrected before the budget was approved. Staff are recommending the purchase of the three-quarter ton truck based on using the remaining money from the two half-ton trucks to cover the over expenditures. <coughs> Any remaining money will be used to install radios, decals, and winter tires. Uh, given that both high-score submissions for the half-ton trucks, engineering and parks are under budget, staff see no reason why town council should not award the supply of those trucks and associated items to Saunders Motors for the total price of 117 16781 8 with HST or 106 251 86 net HST. And Council can elect not to award the three quarter ton to the highest scored submission, GW Mosier. 
for a total price of seventy one thousand four forty two sixty, including HST, or sixty four thousand seven eighty six sixty three net HST, due to its purchase with additional items being over its specific budget allocation. However, this will mean that the Public Works Department must continue to use a 10-year-old truck that is expected to require more maintenance than a newer vehicle and may affect staff efficiency. That's good. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Tanner? I'm just a little con confused by the language in the report, I guess. So, are we? Are you saying that Saunders only had two trucks to offer? Like, they it's very specific to the department, and I don't understand why that is. I guess does that make sense? So Saunders bid on all three trucks. Uh, so for the engineering department, they definitely bid for the half ton. Um, the parks department, they offered two vehicles, a V6 and a V8, and then the three quarter ton, they bid for the public works department as well. So they essentially gave four four bids for for three four, four bids for three from positions. Motors. So three for one four. of them, it's it's the same truck with two options in it, right? Two engines. And we're going with the smaller engine. For okay, the, for the parts truck. Yeah, the smaller engine scored the highest. I didn't relate that. Okay, does that help you? Yes. Somewhat. Is that due to availability or? Uh, the report doesn't say. So you didn't ask for a V8, correct? Yeah. There's no mention of delivery dates in the reports. And I'm not the author. Uh, it looks like 12 weeks for everything except for the, um, mm -hmm. the three quarter, which is uh, uh, 12 to 16. Well, I guess they're all kind of 12 to 16. Yeah. Weeks, mm -hmm. which these mm -hmm. days is pretty good. Yeah. Not bad, if any. considering some are <laughs> 18 to 24 months. So, um, are there other questions, Councilor Bajir? Yeah. Just have a question about like uh, where it says any remaining money will be used to install radios, decals, and winter stocks. That does that normally come out of a separate uh, budget allowance, or to my knowledge, is typically out of the purchase or the capital for the purchase of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. To do the extra decal work and yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I'm still a little confused, I guess, and maybe I'm missing something in the report. But so, if the engineering department, as an example, had a score of 94, right? Why aren't we taking three trucks for the engineering department, so to speak? Does that make sense? Three. Three of the same truck. Three of the same truck. Like other department. Are we very specific about the type of truck per department? I guess Public Works, uh, the Engineering and the Parks Department both requested uh, half ton 4x4s. Okay. And the Public Works Department requested a three quarter ton 4x4. Okay. Four four. Yeah. That's why okay. the so I am on that. Okay, I understand now. Sorry. Claire is. No, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? I had one, but you've already answered it. So okay. go. And I, I'm going to raise this. It's not. It's not a question. You know this is coming. So I, w we need to change how we score these going forward because the way we score, we will never, ever, ever buy an, an electric vehicle in this town because um, it is. We score so heavily based on price. purchase price that the purchase, the cheapest price, will always defeat a, a good score for an electric truck there's not just not enough points because um, pricing is 70 points and the technical is 30 points and the technical includes warranty fuel economy added value for EV and compliance to tender specifications so um, we need to figure out how other communities are tendering so that we look at we're going to keep this truck and, and, and kudos to staff who tend to keep these trucks for 10 years, um, right? Like we run these things for a long time. So if you looked at an eight or 10 year lifespan for an EV, it would be cheaper than the gas vehicle. But it would, we'd never be able to award the tender based on our score. So um, I'm <laughs> just gonna keep raising this every time. But I, and, and we talked about it that maybe it just has to be council's direction that 
we direct staff to change the way that the, the mm -hmm. tender is done, but I'd like to look at how other communities are doing. Staff need to do some research on life cycle cost and, and kind of bring that back in terms of how you would evaluate that versus price. Um, and as you say, we wouldn't be the first unit to do it, so it's yeah. to investigate what other what other municipal units are doing it and also um, provide that training to staff on how to evaluate based on life cycle costs because it's more than just the manufacturer's oh, yeah. manual, and, right? And staff yeah. can't be doing hours and hours yeah. and hours and hours of research yeah. on each model to figure out how long it's going to last. Yeah. And so, but yeah. I would, I think that stuff's yeah. out there. Just yep. So, out, so. Uh, if council wants to give that direction that we we incorporate that into our specifications for vehicles going forward, then staff can bring back a report that would um, provide that kind of analysis on how we would go about doing that and what that would look like. Well, I'd certainly like that to happen. I'd like to deal with this one first, yeah. but maybe we mm -hmm. can maybe sure. we can direct that to that after. So <laughs> let's, do, let's deal with these three trucks. If someone's prepared to make the motion on, on these. Deputy Mayor Hello. Tanner. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse recommendations of staff and award tender 22-05E as follows. Mm -hmm. The 2022 Ram 1500 Classic 4x4 Crew Cab complete with tailgate step and extended warranty for a total of $61,993.08 including HST, $56,217.49 net HST from Saunders Motors Company Limited. 2022 Ram 1500 regular cab V6 complete with tail step and extended warranty for a total of $55,174.73 including HST $50,034.37 net HST from Saunders Motors Company Limited and the 2022 Ford F250 regular cab 4x4 complete with the tailgate step and extended warranty for a total of $71,442.60 including HST $64,786 and 63 cents net HST from GW Mosier Motors Limited, with the over expenditure of $5,786.63, including net HST funded from a portion of the remaining funds from the other two trucks in this tender. Oh, I feel like you did that in one breath. Uh, <laughs> seconded by Councillor Conklin for the discussion. Question none. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Now, do we want to uh, direct staff to go and do some? research on either what other units are doing or best practices for life incorporating cycle. life cycle costs of vehicles into our tendering policy. So Someone's moved prepared it. to move by Councillor Thorburn. Did you get all that? <laughs> sure she did. You know you got it. Uh, the council directs staff to investigate including life cycle costs for vehicles and necessary training for staff to do such evaluations and to include specifications for electric vehicles and requests for proposals or tenders. Works for me. Good. Uh, Sec seconded by Councilor Fugier. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're good. Yep. All right. Any discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. All right, uh, next one is RFP 2022-03, Articulated Over Center Bucket Truck. Evening again. <laughs> uh, again, Council approved this capital project in the 2022-23 operating budget with uh, approved budget of $300,000 net HST. Uh, the present bucket truck in, was purchased in 2000, sorry, present bucket truck is a 2009 International 4300 with an Alltech boom was purchased in 2017 used the purchase of this vehicle was intended to increase the department's ability to perform technical repairs and service for elevated projects such as traffic control lights decorative lighting banner installation and removal along with countless other projects while decreasing the necessity to hire other contractors to perform this work while this vehicle has had its share of costly repairs it has proven its usefulness to the department with the completion of many projects in 2021, during an annual inspection of the aerial device, it was noted that there appeared to be excessive corrosion on the rear stabilizing outriggers. Staff commissioned an engineering firm to perform a metallurgical test on the corroded parts, and it was determined that there was significant corrosion to the point that the aerial testing firm would not certify the vehicle for aerial use until the repairs were completed. A quote was received from this firm for the repairs and for comparison, budget pricing was attained from a local supplier for new and used vehicles. 
This information was presented to Council as part of the budget deliberation process, and it was decided not to complete the repairs due to the high cost and the age of the vehicle. The budget quote received was for a stock build that at the time would be available September of 2022. Staff increased the budget estimate by 6% to allow for cost increases. Staff issued RFP 202203 for the supply of one new articulating over center bucket truck in May of 2022 with a closing date of May 30th. Uh, 11 packages were downloaded from the town's website and we received two packages at closing. Uh, each proponent supplied pricing for a custom build vehicle as there were no stock builds available for purchase at the time. One proponent supplied a second proposal for a used vehicle. The RFP document did not mention used vehicles, but it did encourage proponents to supply multiple offers such as custom builds, stock builds, that may or may not be, be in production or stock on hand vehicles. The used vehicle is a 2022 model year with approximately 20,000 kilometers. Since the RFP document only specified new vehicles with no mention of used vehicles, we have consulted with legal counsel to determine if we can consider this option. Uh, an estimated delivery date of 12 weeks was used in the RFP based on the stock build quote received at the time of budgeting in January of 2022. The proposed delivery estimates range from 60 weeks from McFarland's to 76 weeks for the custom build from Alltech Industries and early July delivery for the used option. Staff would like to note that if Council considers the new custom build option, there will be additional costs incurred as staff will have to rent equipment to complete projects while waiting for the new build delivery date. The RFP document requested pricing for trade-in value for the present 2009 bucket truck and an allowance for two town staff to inspect the proposed vehicles at the manufacturer's facility if they were unable to demo the vehicle on site due to its location. Alltech has allowed $10,000 trade-in value and a $2,500 inspection allowance. McFarland's has allowed $20,000 trade-in value and a $1,000 inspection allowance. The trade-in option may be removed if Council fears, feels the present vehicle could be worth more if sold through the surplus equipment process. Uh, the following are the score, total scores received for the proposals. So for the new Alltech build, they scored 70. Uh, McFarland scored 68. Alltech used scored 72. Uh, the approved budget for this capital project is $300,000. The Alltech Industries custom build vehicle came in at 375, 126.55, including HST, 340, 177.82 net HST, including the trade in option and the on site inspection. Alternatively, the Alltech Industries used option came in at 347, 875, including HST, and 315, 465.15 net HST, including the trade in option and the on site inspection. The McFarland's option came in at 449, 535 or 407-653-97 net HST, including the trade-in option and on-site inspection. All proposals are over budget. Staff consulted with the Director of Finance due to the submissions being over budget and any implications due to budgeting the funding funds to purchase the equipment with debt. The Director has confirmed that we can borrow for a used vehicle, but the term is limited to the useful life of the vehicle as established by the PNS for accounting purposes less the age of the equipment. The life expectancy of the used vehicle is 10 to 15 years, therefore we may repay the funds over eight to 12 year time frame, which is still reasonable. Uh, the options would be based on the detailed review of the RFP, council may consider the following options. Award RFP 2022, supply of one new articulating over center bucket truck to all tech industries as proposed in their RFP dated 30th of May for the purchase of one new articulated bucket truck for the total price of 375 12655 including HST, 340 17780 net HST, including the trade-in value of $10,000 and on-site inspection of $2,500. Number two, award RFP to 2022-03 to Alltech Industries as approved, uh, proposed in their RFP submission dated 30th of May for the used articulating bucket truck for a total purchase price of 347 875 including HST, 
315-465-15 net HST, including the trade-in value of $10,000 and the on-site inspection of $2,500, or number three, as all options are over budget, council may conclude RFP and allow staff to use section 18.1A of the procurement policy, the alternate procurement practice, to purchase a used vehicle that matches our specifications. So as a recommendation, the engineering department is requesting direction on the purchase of an articulated over center bucket truck from town council. Great, thank you. And I know we've received legal opinion that um, <coughs> Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Sure. So, count, council, um, given that the items are over budget, council, is it within their rights to not award the tender, um, given that it exceeded the budget that you provided for? Um, the used vehicle was not um, specified in the RFP, and therefore you would be awarding um, an item that you did not go to proposal call for. So, staff would suggest that perhaps that would be contrary to um, the RFP, and council wishes to procure the a used vehicle, then uh, staff would suggest that um, alternative procurement be used for that, that you not award this tender, and then you would go and solicit specifically used um, bucket trucks through um, um, alternative procurement. Are there questions from Council Thorburn? Yep. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple. The first one, uh, we, we talked about a, a used vehicle uh, life expectancy 10 to 15 years. What would the life expectancy be on, on a new vehicle? Three or four more years? 20 I years? I would assume so. I, I know in the fire service we build vehicles for 20 to 25 20 years, year right. life yeah. expectancy. Yeah. So yeah. I would assume a new vehicle would have a life expectancy of approximately Okay. 15 to 20 years. Yeah, and and the other part, in famous Tim, if we decide that we would pursue the used vehicle, mm -hmm. would that be an open tender? Oh, that so that anybody that sells these vehicles can apply? Alternative procurement would not result in a public proposal call. It would result in request for quotes, um, which it would be um, outside of your your proposal call process. Your policy would require normally, given the value, that you go to public call, right. so proposal. Um, given that it's a used vehicle and there's, there's uh, they come and go on a daily basis, um, sometimes alternative procurement where you're going and you're getting those quotes directly from the lot are a lot easier to deal with than doing a proposal call that can take a month to get bids in and then another month to do the award. So. Um, that's why staff are suggesting that alternative procurement may be um, more appropriate in this case. But if council wishes, uh, you can certainly do a public call uh, and see if there are any out there that could be held for that period of time. Yeah. I, I just, through fairness, one to ask that. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Other questions on this? So, um, just looking at the new. The new versus used. The the other issue we just had this with uh, when we discussed the um, the other vehicles is that is the delivery timeline. So going out to new, you're looking at I see six, to seventy weeks. Yeah, yeah. Right. And in the meantime, we're renting. renting whatever we can. I think you've noted before, Kirk. Sometimes it's a bucket truck, and sometimes it's a scissor lift, and sometimes it's whatever we can get. Yeah, it's very hard lately to get any kind of rental equipment because if larger uh, construction jobs are renting the equipment, they're not giving them back and taking them. They're, they're keeping them for the full term, so it's getting hard to get rental equipment as well. Okay. Any other questions? Some are prepared to make a motion. Councillor Conklin. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that Council for the Town of Ridgewater not award tender 2022-03 articulated over center bucket truck, close the tender, and proceed with alternative procurement options. Do we, do we need to change that? It's just a word. just note that it's an RFP, not a tender. Yep, so you're good with it. Just we'll just change the word tender to RFP. RFP. Yeah. <laughs> two zero two two dash zero. Perfect. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. Further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Those opposed? 
motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, 9.3, Bridgewater Business Park Soil and Groundwater Delineation Program and Wetland Alteration Application. Mr. Brown. Good evening. So, uh, the issue of soil and groundwater uh, delineation and wetland alteration was brought up and discussed uh, last week in the Business Park Update. Uh, so this is a follow-up to that in terms of some some further action on, on those issues. Um, so to begin with the, uh, the first proposed program of work, uh, the soil and groundwater delineation program would involve uh, a more detailed environmental site assessment being completed with additional test pits and wells to further delineate the extent of the contamination uh, following that, a remedial action plan and risk management plan would be prepared in accordance with ministerial protocols. A closure report and confirmation of remedia remediation report, rather, is also required as is a record of site condition or declaration of property condition as applicable, as well as the monitoring of, of the well decommissioning, I believe a minimum of three drilled wells is included in the work. So total fees to undertake uh, the above is estimated at $54,000 excluding HST and it uh, should be noted that the costs are for the assessment, the testing and reporting only and do not include the potential cost of cleanup, removal or on-site solutions involving uh, potentially uh, capping contaminated soils on the property. So it's our starting point. Back up a bit. So the outline area here outlined in red is essentially the suspected area of contamination and laid that over the phase one area of the of the site. So in terms of the uh, wetland alteration application, um, the province has uh, gone through a similar process of applying for approval to alter some of the wetlands in the area in the construction of the interchange and essentially the town must now also uh, make a similar application to uh, firstly address the location of a stormwater management pond for phase one of the park uh, but also to uh, to look at the the overall uh, uh, extent of wetlands in that phase one area so the town must also retain professional services to complete the, that application work. So the work involved with, with that uh, is as follows. It essentially conduct a functional assessment of the wetlands, uh, prepare and submit the appropriate applications to the Nova Scotia environment and climate change. Uh, consultation with DFO uh, if required. I think most recently we've determined that they that is not unlikely to be required but we've left it on the list in case uh, coordinate with the wetland compensation service provider to determine the cost of compensation for any uh, proposed alterations that might uh, come be defined or come forward and design and implement a five-year monitoring program to gauge the impact of development activity uh, within the affected area so the total fees and expenses to, to complete this work is estimated to be in the vicinity of $50,000 excluding HST and uh, costs, these costs also do not include the costs of compensation for disturbed wetland areas which uh, would be uh, in the order of seven to seven fifty dollars um, per square meter of disturbed or altered wetland. So. We essentially have to do uh, an assessment and application to site the stormwater management pond. It's more efficient for us to look at the entire phase one area and and assess all of the wetlands in that particular area at one time uh, so we know where we're headed. So the objective here is not to uh, alter the entire wetland. The objective is likely to maintain as light a footprint on this as, as we can reasonably do and still still move forward and this would be the, 
the general area in question as well down here within the phase one area. The, the light colored area are those areas that have already been addressed uh, through applications by the province of, of Nova Scotia and uh, our work would, would focus again within this phase one area in terms of uh, what, what work we may want to do. So in terms of uh, financial and budget implications, the combined costs of both projects uh, totals $104,000 excluding taxes. Uh, as noted, these don't, uh, these don't include uh, uh, some additional costs with disposing of material and uh, compensation for wetland disturbance. Uh, we noted in our update that the current budget does not have funds allocated for, for this work. However, the uh, recent deferment and deferral of, uh, of a number of engineering and public works projects uh, exceeds that amount. Uh, so the intent would be to monitor the operating budget to uh, to determine whether those, these costs can be covered. Uh, in light of that, uh, failing that, uh, council may reserve uh, may fund the projects from uh, reserve rather. Now, in terms of legal implications, both projects will reduce our site-based constraints on parks expansion, and and are intended to ensure our legal compliance with current environmental regulations uh, governing contaminated sites and wetland alteration in Nova Scotia. And in terms of strategic priorities and work plan, it is a strategic priority of Council in terms of the business park expansion and exit 12A interchange project, as well as land sales. <coughs> so the uh, staff recommendation is to Council 1, authorize the unbudgeted expenditures $54,000 to conduct the soil and groundwater delineation program and that pursuant to section 18 of the purchasing and tendering policy council authorized alternative procurement for the procurement of these services and by way of background we outline in the written report uh, essentially uh, an engineering firm has done a considerable amount of work to date for both the province and then laterally for the town in terms of delineating uh, some of the uh, contamination so they have a body of knowledge now and an analysis completed. Uh, it would not make sense for us to go back to the market and um, pay for that work again. Uh, and it's also a question of timing uh, in terms of uh, we have a one year limit to conduct all of this and file all of these reports uh, from the date of our filing which was May 31. So for those two reasons, we would recommend that approach. Uh, and number two, council, that council authorized the unbudgeted expenditure of up to $50,000 to undertake the wetlands assessment, including coordinating with the wetland compensation contractor, monitoring program, wetland impact plan, related applications for same. And I believe that uh, we have recommended be uh, be ad addressed uh, through an existing body of work and a change order uh, for the consultants that would do that work. And I can take any questions at that at this point. Great, thank you. Can everyone? Can you also refresh your e-scribe too, please? And thank you. Did you have a? Um, just in, just in terms of. of of how we fund the over budgeted expenditure um, at this point um, normally we would say take it from reserve or that type of thing but we're suggesting that we um, we, if we remain unbudgeted and as we go through the fiscal year we'll determine whether there's a surplus that could be funded from or as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year we may suggest that you fund it from reserve we we'll just kind of see where that where that kind of lands towards the end of the year Questions, follow up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Just so the uh, public is clear, and so I'm clear as well. So the the wetlands assessment um, <clears throat> is not simply a, a, a means for us to just bulldoze the wetlands. It's it's to keep the wetland viable while also allowing development. Is that, is that yes, uh, certainly. And, and the cost uh, in terms of the seven dollars to seven dollars and fifty cents per square meter. Uh, is a, a real financial constraint in terms of, in, in that area as well. But I, I think the approach really has to be to, to maintain as much of it as possible. And there are a few, a few small areas where a little bit of infilling might allow us to 
to proceed with a small amount of development, but mm -hmm. essentially it'll be for, to site the stormwater management pond itself and also to, to maybe address a couple of isolated areas that are not contiguous with the overall uh, main wetland that exists there. So there's a few spots that are isolated and off by themselves. Uh, the province certainly has addressed some of those in their work and, and we'd have uh, one or two or three of those to address as well. Other questions? Councilor Reed, look like you have one. Yeah, I, I do with the climate change and uh, environment. Uh, there must be some monies available to assist with this program. I know the brown sites we used to do some funding for that, contaminated soil. I would think, would there be anything, uh, Tammy, to deal with uh, wetlands? Any funding sources available? To delineate them? Mm. Um, I'm not aware. We'd have to, if we were looking at uh, some way of incorporating it into a stormwater management pond or something, like there may be. Um, well, we, we, we're constantly reviewing what's out there for grants and see how we can match it up to our capital plans mm -hmm. so if there if there is something there we'll find it um, but i'm not aware of anything right at this point that for this particular piece of work okay. maybe as we approach development and that type of thing there may be because this is probably the the low end of the spectrum the hundred and yes 000. this is this is just to determine what we have yeah, and make sure we clearly understand mediation. it yeah, yeah. And with the contaminated soil, it's about uh, delineating that as well right. and coming up with a plan for how we handle that. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's the easy part. <laughs> Other questions? Hearing none, is someone prepared to make a motion? <laughs> Councilor Conklin, please. I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater authorize the unbudgeted expenditures of $54,000 to conduct the soil and groundwater de uh, delineation program and that pursuant to Section 18 of the Town's Purchasing and Tendering Policy, Council authorize alternative procurement for the procurement of these services and authorize the CAO to award to Stantec and that council authorized the unbudgeted expenditure of up to $50,000 to undertake the wetlands assessment, including coordinating with a wetland compensation contractor, monitoring program, wetland impact plan, and related applications to NSECC for same. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Caldwell. Further discussion? Question none. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is uh, tax reduction policy 65 for uh, some properties in town that um, were destroyed. <coughs> Earlier this year, we received an application under policy 65 for a tax reduction um, for two assessment accounts uh, within the town. Um, the properties were destroyed in late December of 2021. And so um, both interim and final tax bills would have been issued and paid um, for, for last fiscal period. Um, and so property was destroyed in December um, and they would have paid their taxes up until March 31st of 2022. Um, so there's a few months there that technically taxes were covered, which policy 65 permits council the ability to grant up to $1,000 prorated for the year um, of tax relief um, for properties. And so this property would receive approximately, if it was granted, um, it would be worth about $350 per property of tax relief for last fiscal year. In addition to that, the tax assessment rules that we receive in December of 2021 are effective December 1st of 2021. And so PVSC would not go back and adjust that assessment rule for the fact that those properties um, are destroyed because it's as of December 1 and the event happened subsequent to that. Um, so this, our policy would technically cover um, our current fiscal year that we're in, 22-23, um, up to the date of any reconstruction or, um, of that property. 
and uh, to the date of an occupancy permit. So they potentially could also, um, under the policy, receive a grant or a tax relief um, for 22-23, which we would be able to calculate on March 31st of 2023 um, to provide relief for that fiscal year as well. And then after that date, the next assessment roll from PBSC for next fiscal year would already be adjusted for that and would just be based on the, the value of what was remaining in that property. So we are requesting that council um, approve to um, apply the policy for 21-22 and we would provide tax relief um, for the prorated portion of last year and that also um, we approve the tax relief for 22-23 to be calculated at approximately March 31st once we know if building and reconstruction has happened. Thank you. Any questions to the Director of Finance? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Caldwell? Move the council for the town of Bridgewater approve the reduction of taxes for both 30 and 32 South Street as per policy 65 tax reduction for the tax year 21-22 and by March 31st 2023 if the property has not yet been reconstructed approve a reduction for 22-23. Thank you. Seconded by Council Conklin. Further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? opposed motion is carried thank you then business arising unfinished business policy three travel proposed kilometer <laughs> yeah changing the travel policy <laughs> <laughs> Miley trait Miley trait yeah <laughs> so at the, at the last meeting council gave notice to itself that at tonight's council meeting you would consider amendments to your travel policy Essentially, what the amendments do is update the, the mileage rate to the present provincial rate, which was always the intent of the policy. It's just that rather than just saying it follows the provincial rate, it actually puts the numbers in there every time. So the amendments are um, would see that uh, the, the rate would change, and essentially for most uh, drivers, it would go from 42 cents a kilometer to 51.3 cents per kilometer. Uh, and the policy would be revised to just state it would be the provincial mileage rate. So every time that, that the provincial mileage rate goes up, it goes up. If it goes down, it goes down. Um, in addition to that, there are two employees that presently have a car allowance, and that car allowance rate has been in place for, um, well, since 2006, and has not has not been, um, I believe it was 2006, uh, has not been changed since then. And um, staff are recommending that council update that to the provincial power rate as well, which would be it would go from 264 a month to 387 a month. And uh, we are, as new employees come on, we're not putting them under the car allowance. We're using town vehicles, but we still have two that are under that. Um, so this would update that rate to make it more reflective of the current market and. Um, we're suggesting council approves that by motion, so there's a separate motion for that to set that rate. And in addition to the proposed um, car allowance, they get a rate, a, a kilometer rate, and that would go from 24.1 to 29.3, which again is the provincial rate. So the financial impacts total for the year would be anywhere from 78 to 88 hundred. And um, as noted in the report, the last few years have been almost non-existent for mileage claims simply because uh, no one's been going anywhere and we we have seen a, a decrease in mileage simply because we can do virtual meeting options now as before COVID we didn't have that so um, it's difficult to kind of give you an estimate based on history because history is not going to be the same going forward but that's what we anticipate it will be is five to six thousand for mileage and then you have the 2800 for um, the increase in the power allowance for the two two individuals. So the recommendation is is that council approve the revisions to the tra the travel policy policy number three to adopt the provincial mileage rate uh, for reimbursement for staff and council, and that would be effective July 1st, 2022. And that council set the car rate for regular users per policy three travel policy at $397.40 with an associated mileage rate of 29.3 cents per kilometer effective July 1st, 2022. 
questions? On the motion? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> I would so move that town council with the town of Bridgewater approve the revised policy three, travel and uh, the personal policy section 8.4 as presented in document 22-097 and adopt the provincial climb reach rate along with the new car rate for regular users and the associated climb reach rate effective July the 1st, 2022. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fugier. Further discussion? Councilor Colwell. Um, I'm just wondering why we have, why do we have employees using a car allowance if it's something we want to phase out? Um, so I, the history on that, I, can't, I wasn't <laughs> present and that's been a long standing thing. Normally it's because you don't have the vehicles that would be, uh, in, in, in terms of number, that would ne enable them to have a vehicle to do, to do their work. So rather than paying mileage, which could be more, um, you pay a car rate plus a, a kilometer rate. Um, the town has been progressing towards building up their, their fleet so that there are sufficient vehicles for staff, so building inspector, fire inspector, those types of things so that we have in stealth. Um, and so as new employees come on, it's not an option provided to them, but we still have these, these um, that are under that. Uh, there is my, from talking to engineering, because I have had that conversation about can we eliminate it. Of course, you'd have to give notice because you're changing the terms of employment and all that. Um, one is to our, our chief, fire chief, who uses his own vehicle, and another is to a engineering staff employee. So um, my understanding is it's with the engineering staff, there isn't sufficient vehicles. So that person needs a dedicated vehicle every day to do their job. And there isn't a dedicated vehicle for that position to do their job. So they use their own personal vehicle to do that. So it would take purchasing another, another vehicle. Um, and we will um, do that analysis at some point to uh, look at does it make sense to buy and that's certainly been the direction we've been going in, is owning the vehicle and controlling that as opposed to having having that, but that's kind of the arrangement that was put in place for that position. I think, Tammy, that came in effect when I first took over in Chief 2005-2006. Mm -hmm. that, that, that the monies that were paid for that, uh, the lesser mileage rate, it wasn't, uh, you didn't make any money, but you were using your own personal vehicle 24-7 mm -hmm. to do a volunteer service and uh, the rest of the time you used it for whatever you had to use it for. And it's the same <coughs> thing with Michael, the current chief. Yeah. The only way around that would be to buy a, a vehicle for him, but then he still works on his job. So have, this seems to be the fairest way that you could, could do it for that particular position at this point in time, yeah. to be fair to the town and be fair to the volunteer. Thanks. I'm glad for the question, though, for the public explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We have a mover and seconder. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Amendments to policy 88, donations. Thank you. All right, so earlier this spring, the town staff received a request from an amateur artist who sees various infrastructure about town as a canvas everything from our green concrete uh, garbage receptacles to power boxes and all those sorts of things. Um, and we, so we don't have a public art policy uh, that would have accepted his proposal. So we took it, we referred it to the Parks, Recreation, Culture Committee um, to discuss that. And he presented at the April 26th meeting. And through that discussion, um, the Parks, Recreation, Culture Committee made a recommendation that the director bring forward a report to council on a recommendation uh, that staff, that council direct staff to develop a public art policy that would enable, we started talking about a wide range of how we might incorporate public art, what public art is, what the town might be able to initiate versus what community and especially um, community could come together to create. And so we took a look at the existing, where public art fits in our existing policies is within the donations policy. So that's what you have in front of you and what we gave notice at the last council meeting are we realized that with a few small amendments to the existing donations policy, we could create space uh, for town-led public art initiatives 
uh, and also to remove the requirement that it's just a professional artist and that it could be artists of any kind. Um, and so the, uh, the, you have the, the versions of the amendments, uh, but we suggest the following clause be added, that through a pub the public art program, the town of Bridgewater may invite artists to submit applications for donations to a town-led public art project. All public art projects and related donations are subject to council approval, which is aligned with how the policy had been laid out before. But that would allow staff and the, uh, the Parks, Recreation, Culture Advisory Committee to lead public art projects, such as a call for applications to beautify town-owned garbage cans or other types of infrastructure. Um, we also recommend adding that the installation costs of public art feature may be budgeted through a town because town-led project, if it was something that we were undertaking versus the way it is in the donations policy, that those costs are, are part of the donation. And we're also recommending um, that uh, amend the policy to remove the regulation that it's created by a professional artist um, and that we believe that the review and approval process for public art as already outlined in the donations policy would be sufficient to ensure that public art donations are appropriate and of benefit to the community. They don't necessarily have to be by, and I don't know how you accredit whether they're a professional artist or not, but so we also uh, propose some housekeeping edits uh, just to bring the, the policy up to current titles and such. Okay. Any questions? I, I love this. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Um, any questions or comments on that? Councillor Caldwell? I, uh, I also um, I like the uh, amendments. Um, but I uh, am wondering about the deaccession part. I think that the town should have broad, uh, broad powers to deaccess, have art removed if it sees fit. There are some. I know there's a section in the policy that allows for that, but it sort of gives an examples. I don't know. I, I just wonder if I don't want our hands to be tied if we choose to remove something, with the wording being a little too strict. Mm. I just want a reassurance that that's fine. That part of it is fine. In that manner, we can take another look. We can bring forward yeah. further amendments if we take a second look. We weren't looking at the deaccession uh, components, but we certainly can. Just I don't know how council feels about that. If it's if it's art on, because you're just talking about things on our property, right? So wouldn't we? What would possibly right. s stop us from removing something that's on our? Well, I think that's where when it's a, a donation of you know. So this is where this is originally a donations policy. Um, it does have a section. Mm -hmm. It's on page four of six in the document that's on eScribe. Uh, it's the second last paragraph where it talks about the town has the right and responsibility to deaccession public art. All reasonable efforts shall be made to resolve problems with the public art in consultation with the artist and or donor where appropriate reasons for deaccession include but are not limited to endangerment of public safety, so if something becomes unsafe about the, the donation, excessive repair, maintenance, or irreparable damage, inaccessibility, or site redevelopment. So that was really very much thinking about it in the context of we received a donation, say, of a large statue, and then we want to do something with it, and we actually don't want to redeploy it to another space. We then have to take these measures, consider why we might be removing that public art donation, and take certain uh, efforts to resolve any issues that might have happened if it became unsafe, for example, or uh, if we're redeveloping the site, what would we do? Would we give it back to the artist? Would we donate it somewhere else? So I can see where you have some, you know, yeah. what is the framework for Yeah, that? I'm also thinking, like, in the future, it could be deemed inappropriate. Right. It could become an eyesore. Yeah. And also, what happens if it's a donation? Like, do we destroy it? Does it go back to the person that created it? Just, I don't know if we need a little more um, if that needs to be a little more explicit or I'm hoping know. that the not limited to gives us broader yeah. uh, powers I, I would almost think you this even though it says not limited to this almost is almost like the condition of it right as right. opposed to its appropriateness 20 years from now or, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be so um, I think you would want to if that's a concern that it's more the acceptance of it socially shall we say mm -hmm. or you know 
um, that we would have something, in, some type of criteria in there that would make it more than just the condition. Mm -hmm. So again, as I stated, we didn't, we weren't looking at those clauses. We were looking at how to enable a town-led public art program. Uh, but we can certainly take another look at it mm -hmm. um, for a future set of amendments, perhaps. And I think that we would collaborate with the museum, who has robust guidance on deaccession mm -hmm. of, of items from their collection. So we'd be able to lean on their uh, deep experience in that. No. Okay. So the, that'll work its way back at some point as I said. Okay. okay. Other questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Caldwell. I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the revised policy 88 donations as presented in document 22-096 for the town effective immediately. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Coughlin. We have a discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 10.3 proposed amendment personnel personnel policy flexible work options. The council gave itself notice at the last council meeting that tonight council would be considering at this meeting amendments to the personnel policy that would enable flexible working options for the town of Bridgewater employees. So um, part of the discussion that we had respecting this is that there's um, a changing workforce where there is expectation um, that um, employers provide some flexibility in terms of work options. The benefits of doing that are um, more improved service delivery, there's better health and well-being, more engaged employees, and in some cases a reduced cost in real estate for the employer. And that can also be uh, a way to help retain as well as attract new employees. And in fact, we're finding that as we recruit employees, it's, it's, it's an automatic question about what are your flexible work options. It's, it's expected. Um, and uh, it's just that there's been a greater value placed on that than the traditional workplace options. So the Management Labor Relations Committee, as well as the senior management team, have been looking at this topic over the past few years, particularly since COVID, which really kind of introduced some new ways of working to the, to the work to employees as well as employers. And in 2020, we tried, tried to look at that with a four-day compressed work week. It was kind of when that was starting to come out. And it was clear when we looked at that that given the nature of the positions in the town and the varied jobs and some requ are required to be at the front counter, others work with the public directly, others don't, that one size does not fit all. Um, and staff at that time, uh, we didn't have sufficient support to move forward with that one solution for the entire organization, um, personal life choices as well as, as, as their, their particular functions. Um, made that clear that that wasn't going to work so we've been kind of exploring how we can provide some flexibility in the workforce at, without the one-size-fits-all approach and that's where we've uh, done some jurisdictional scans of other municipalities in Nova Scotia that information is provided in the report but it shows that increasingly municipalities um, are starting to look at uh, remote work so work from home a hybrid approach of some in the office, some, some remote, compressed work week, earned days off, which has been around for a while um, with some employers, and modified work hours. So those are kind of the blend of things that they're looking at. Um, some do all of them, some do a few of those things. Uh, so we took a look at it as the Management Labor Relations Committee and the Strategic, and the strategic Management Team and are recommending that uh, Council look at amendments to the personnel policy that would enable for non-unionized staff, unionized staff is, it, are different, they're, they're negotiated through collective agreement, but for non-unionized staff, um, the personnel policy enabled uh, this, myself as the chief administrative officer to develop guidelines or protocols that would provide for a four-day compressed work week if chosen and, and you're able to accommodate that as the employer. So operational requirements of the town are paramount and if those can be met a uh, four-day work week or earn day off which is where you work an extra half hour for 14 days and you get the 15th day off um, variable hours where you can alter your start and finish by a certain amount 
Um, so I think we were suggesting that when we looked at it, it'd be like 6.30 a.m., no, no earlier than 6.30 a.m., no later than 9, and that you couldn't end your day no, no earlier than 2.30 or no later than 7. So just kind of vary in that. Or a work-from-home arrangement hybrid model where two days out of the week, if your role accommodated that, um, and operational requirements were still able to be met that you could work two days per week from home. And then you can you can also blend those so you can do a four day compressed work week and one one day from home type thing. Um, or earn day off and still do the work from home. Uh, and the guidelines would set out all of the, the kind of the criteria that would have to be met. There would be a, a an agreement between the employer and the employee about how that would work. And uh, there would be the ability to modify that as the program got rolled out. And some things are going to work, some things aren't. And we'd be able to adjust accordingly to that. So the amendments um, are shown, uh, what's required uh, in terms of changes to your uh, personnel policy to implement those. And essentially, it doesn't provide a lot of detail, just says that here's what it means. And uh, the CAO can develop guidelines to enable this for operationally feasible to, um, to do so. Questions? Councillor Thurber and then Councillor Cole. Yeah, Tammy, you told me numerous times, but my old brain doesn't seem to pick up on to it. How many non-union employees would this affect? Is it 42 or 62? Uh, or it's 82? around, I'd say about 43, 45 non-union yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I, I thought. So, because it the unionized employees would have to go through contract negotiation. They would have to go through collect yeah. collective and, agreements. Um, yeah. If there was an interest, then we would, we would either have to negotiate that separately or turn our next round of negotiations. Right. Yeah. No. No. I, I think it's a, it's a good move for employees. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's uh, <clears throat> My question was already answered, but uh, I do. Sa I will say I support this enthusiastically. I think this makes us a, a good a better modern employer. Other questions? Councilor yeah, Gere? I'm glad to see um, as an employer that we're exploring the options, um, knowing that it's competitive. Um, uh, you know, when you post a position, a professional position, it, it just uh, allows us to be um, considered for an employee, employer. Um, and I'm glad to see those options being made available. I think it creates a better work-life balance, and when you do that, we know s statistically that you get uh, a more productive workforce. So mm -hmm. it's it benefits everybody, including the, at the end yeah. of the day, the taxpayer, because yeah. you're you're uh, attracting top talent, and um, and they're it's, it's yeah, I think it's a great great idea. Further discussion? Is someone prepared to make a motion, Councillor Thorburn? I would move that Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater approve the revised personnel policy as presented in document 22-098 and enable flexible working options for town employees effective July 11th, 2022. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Conklin. We've had a good discussion. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Our last item tonight, 10.4 Watershed, Bridgewater Watershed Protection Alliance, Atlantic Whitefish Protection Request for Letter of Support. So. We had a presentation uh, from a delegation, great presentation explaining um, about the, uh, the issues of very rare species, whether it's whitefish or, or some uh, lichen and, and things like that, and the harms that can be done in a very ecologically sensitive area. So the request was made um, that we provide a letter of support to the watershed for the Watershed Protection Alliance's submission to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. What is Council's wish. Someone prepared okay. to make a motion? Councilor Brazier? Yes, I'll make a motion, Your Worship. Uh, I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater provide a letter of support for the Bridgewater Watershed Protection Alliance submission to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change regarding wilderness area designation for public lands in the Petite Riviere watershed in order to minimize threats to species at risk in the Petite Riviere watershed preserve biodiversity and carbon sequestration, provide recreational opportunities and quality of life, and ensure protection of the town of Bridgewater water source. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Caldwell. 
Um, before we have the, the vote, I will say a couple of weeks ago, staff and I met with the minister. Um, uh, our director of community development gave a great presentation on, uh, on Energize Bridgewater and where it was. And uh, to say he was enthusiastic is probably a bit of an understatement. He was very enthusiastic. So just to give you an example, you know that they're very set to a schedule because ministers come and they only have a certain amount of time before they have to go somewhere else. They stayed late um, because they wanted that delegation. He seemed to bring his whole team. They wanted to hear the whole thing. So, um, so I will be sending this letter. <laughs> uh, this letter will arrive on the minister's desk, but the minister was just here a couple weeks ago, and I, I did get the sense that um, he's very much on the in the right portfolio when it comes to environment and climate change. So that's good. So we have a mover and a seconder. Are you ready for the question? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, we have nothing under new business. We do have an in-camera meeting following this to deal with uh, Section 22 2A under the MGA, Acquisition, Sale, Lease, and Security of Municipal Property. So uh, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Mm -hmm. Councilor Thorburn, seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. We are adjourned. <laughs>